Right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, my name is Fraser MacDonald, and I'm the Chief Examiner in Spanish for Edexcel. Uh, and this afternoon, I'm very pleased that you've joined me in this chat room uh, to look at how to mark Spanish GCSE uh, speaking controlled assessments. Uh, if you look at the screen, you'll see the objectives for today. Um, if you've ever attended a feedback session in the past, for example, last year or the year before that, you will know that we've spent a long time going through the specification, explaining it, talking about the preparation that you and the students have to do, talking about all the paperwork. None of that is going to be relevant today. We're going to concentrate exclusively on how to mark the controlled assessments. And that means looking very closely at the marking criteria, those assessment grids that we use uh, to determine the final mark when we hear an oral. Uh, we're going to listen to some live material, that is, uh, examples of orals taken from the summer exam at a range of different abilities and grade levels. Uh, you're going to be doing some of the marking, and we're going to check those marks against those awarded by the examiners. So let's go straight in then to activity one, which is looking at the transcript of an open interaction task. You won't actually hear the recording. We're going to work uh, in progressively uh, looking at the transcript and underneath you can see there are three voting polls uh, which all relate to the first assessment grid which is content and response. Now within those assessment grids there are key words that we need to understand and the first one I'm going to look at is comprehensive and detailed. Now those words occur in the top box for a candidate who's going to score uh, 16 to 18 marks. They need to communicate comprehensive and detailed information. If you look at the box below for somebody getting 12 to 15 marks, the word comprehensive disappears. You're left with detailed and relevant. So the idea has been diluted slightly. Moving to the middle box, 8 to 11, the word detailed disappears and you're left with relevant information. The box below, 4 to 7, uh, relevant disappears and limited takes its place. And in the bottom box, for 1 to 3, minimal description. So you can see that that one idea communicates comprehensive and detailed information is gradually diluted as you go down the grid from one to another. Uh, and that is true of all these descriptors. We call these words descriptors in the assessment criteria. Uh, so uh, looking at what does uh, comprehensive and detailed information actually mean? Well, in simple terms, it means we know a lot more at the end of the oral test than we did at the beginning because the candidate has provided us with an awful lot of relevant information willingly without waiting to be asked for it. Not just giving minimal answers to the questions, but developing the answers, giving plenty of ideas and information. Uh, now, at this point, I need to draw a distinction between the presentation task and the open interaction and the picture-based discussion tasks. And the difference is this. If you listen to a, a candidate who's chosen to do a presentation, the first three minutes of that oral test will be packed full of information, usually pre-learnt and very often recited. So it's when you get to the interaction, when the candidate stops the monologue, and the teacher begins to ask questions that you begin to get a feel for the real ability of the candidate. That is not to say that you don't give them credit for the presentation, but you need to balance it against uh, what they manage to achieve in the question and answer uh, conversation with the teacher afterwards. Uh, with the other two task types, the information comes through as a sort of drip feed all the way through. Looking at the second box, interaction, what does that mean? I think it means that the candidate can respond to any question that has been asked at the appropriate level, even if it's only to say something like, I'm not sure about that. 
So teachers who work from a preset list of questions don't give their candidates opportunities for interaction because it is inextricably linked to spontaneity. You can tell when a conversation has been rehearsed or when the teacher is not listening to what the candidate says, but simply going from one question to another. That is not a conversation. It's a question and answer session. And we want really a conversation to give the candidate the opportunity to show spontaneity. And the last box, ideas and points of view. This is very often opinions, isn't it? The candidate expresses an opinion about something uh, and simply saying me gusta or no me gusta is not enough unless they follow it with por qué and explain the reason uh, for um, uh, their views or their opinions. So the boxes below, I'd like you to look very closely at that transcript, which is a real transcript from this summer's exam. You won't be, of course, be able to hear the candidate delivering it, so you won't be able to mark pronunciation, intonation or anything like that. Just concentrate on uh, information related to the visual topic or stimulus. Is it comprehensive and detailed? Is it detailed and relevant? And so on. So if you'd like for that, and also for the second box, interaction, is the interaction very good or just good? Or is there some interaction? And the ideas and the points of view, if you'd like to vote on that as well. Uh, so I'll let Rohan give you control of the transcript so you can spend some time looking at it and casting your votes accordingly. So over to you. Right, I think most of you have now voted. Thank you for that. Let's now have a look closely at that uh, transcript. The candidate clearly does provide a good deal of information for every question that he or she has been asked. And there's communication maintained throughout, despite inaccuracies of language. Uh, and in, if you heard it, a little bit of pronunciation. There's a lot of elaboration of responses. There is evidence of subordination and of opinion. For example, he says, Recomiendo esta galería porque está llena de pinturas y esculturas interesantes. He recommends the art gallery and explains why. And again, No hay un restaurante ahí, pero hay uno al lado del camino que sirve buenas comidas y una amplia variedad de bebidas. There's a lot of information there. It doesn't simply uh, stop with no hay un restaurante ahí and wait for the next question, but develops the answer in quite an elaborate way. Sometimes the sentences are shorter, but the candidate will provide two or three shorter sentences in answer to a question and therefore offer plenty of information. Uh, he, he or she also asks a question, ¿Qué prefiere, museos o galerías de arte? The interaction with the teacher examiner is good. There's little or no hesitation in his responses or her responses. Only once does the candidate misunderstand a question about when the football match begins. But when the teacher examiner interrupts and repeats the question, he or she answers in full. Uh, you may be interested to know that the teacher examiner awarded 16, which is top box, in the top box, but not 18, or 17, 16, uh, and I think that is a fair assessment. Uh, so I would have certainly put, uh, voted for comprehensive and detailed in box one, and probably interacts well, uh, and uh, little difficulty expressing opinions. So it's not quite a full 18 marks, uh, but 16 is a very, very good mark for this candidate to be given. Now, if we move on to the next poll, we'll look at the other two uh, assessment grids, which are range of language and accuracy. So if we can turn to those, please. Thank you. That's what I was after. Right, let's have a look at those descriptors as well before we actually get on to marking it. Range of language, wide ranging, including some complex lexical items. Uh, we're looking for the candidate's ability to demonstrate a variety of vocabulary, verb forms, and structures that are appropriate to the discussion. 
This includes verb manipulation, using the correct form and tense of the verb. For example, the number of times you hear when listening to an oral a question, que hiciste? And back comes the reply, hiciste deporte. So we're looking at the ability to manipulate verbs correctly as well. Complex lexical items, what on earth are they? Well, on pages 53 to 54 of the specification, it tells you a number of things to look for when gauging complexity at a higher level. Um, I might just cover a few now. The use of pronouns is pretty important. Uh, if a candidate can say, voy a decírselo, for example, or mi padre me lo dio, then the ability to handle pronouns is a complex uh, technique. The reflexive pronouns and changing the person of the verb. For example, normalmente me acuesto a las diez, pero mi hermano se acuesta a las siete. Using the same reflexive verb, but changing the pronoun and changing the verb form demonstrates complexity. A variety of negatives. No solo, sino también. Ni español, ni francés. Uh, no voy nunca, or nunca voy, using negatives for emphasis. No me gusta historia, tampoco. Verb forms, a variety of verb usage we're looking for, not necessarily past, present, and future. That re really was left over from the old specification. We're looking for the person and the tense or time frame to be correct. You can get away with two different past tenses within one sentence, for example. Cuando caminaba por la calle, vi un accidente de coches. Using an imperfect and a preterite within one sentence demonstrates a variety of verb forms. Uh, the, the getting the person of the verb right, fui and fue, is always a problem with some candidates. If they ha use a subjunctive, a present subjunctive, fine, it's not necessary to demonstrate complexity, but they've got to use it correctly. Uh, a, a lot of candidates think they must get a, a, a subjunctive in to get the top box, which is untrue. And sometimes you come across a candidate that says, uh, espero que vaya a la, uni a la universidad, instead of espero ir, using a subjunctive inappropriately. So watch out for things like that. Using radical changing verbs, the number of times I hear Volvo instead of Vuelvo, or Podo instead of Puedo, or Hugo instead of Juego. The position and agreement of adjectives, and also looking for connecting words for subordinate clauses. No obstante, sin embargo, ya que, así que. All of these things demonstrate complexity. Right, well I was, thank you. I was dealing with these descriptors in the range of language and accuracy boxes, and I dealt with complex lexical items. A whole variety of things could be regarded as complex, not simply verbs, but also pronouns, uh, negatives, agreement and position of adjectives, and all sorts of things. But I'm not going to repeat all that, because I, uh, uh, I'm sorry if you missed some of that. But at least it'll be recorded, and you can listen in again, hopefully, uh, once it's on on the web. Uh, looking at subordination, it means a candidate supplying longer sentences by using connecting words like no obstante, sin embargo, or simply pero, uh, to make a sentence uh, full of clauses uh, and subordinate clauses, instead of uh, simply a, a subject, object, and, uh, and ver subject, verb, and object. Use of different tenses and time frames. What's the difference between a tense and a time frame? Well, let me tell you what a, I think a time frame is. Uh, using the desdeate construction with a present tense. Estudio el español desde hace dos años. You're really talking about the past. It translates into a past tense in English. I have been studying Spanish for two years. And that is a time frame. You, dealing with the past by using a present tense in the desdeathe construction. And different tenses doesn't necessarily mean just past, present, and future. You can get away with a variety of tenses even within a single sentence. 
cuando caminaba por la calle vi un accidente de coches using an imperfect and a preterite within one sentence demonstrates the ability to handle different tenses so now I'd like you to look through once again that transcript we're ranging over range of language um, vocabulary uh, is it wide ranging including some complex items is it simply just a good variety structures and subordination and the use of different tenses and time frames if you'd like please to look through the transcript once more and register your votes please and we'll have a look at accuracy and um, really the key word here is what is a significant error a significant error is an error which gets in the way of communication uh, so an, an occasional slip like the wrong gender or the adjective not agreeing won't stop you understanding what the candidate is trying to say and there is the candidate here does uh, maintain a good level of accuracy with the occasional slip el museos una estadio recomendiré una restaurante es buen ocupado but really they don't get in the way of your understanding what the candidate is saying at all so they're fairly insignificant errors uh, the teacher examiner awarded five for accuracy and I think that is a fair assessment so all in all that candidate would have scored 26 in total uh, which is just about an A star and of course what we couldn't uh, uh, assess would be uh, the uh, pronunciation and intonation but we're coming to that so let's move on then to beyond this transcript to a real recording buenos dias buenos dias que tal muy bien muy bien muy bien ah, ok que 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 pasa en esta foto in esta foto estoy jugando al baloncesto femenino y me gusta mucho porque es divertido y cada partido es diferente y desafiante. ¿Y cuándo empezaste a jugar? Um, empecé al baloncesto femenino cuando yo estaba en escuela primaria porque me sentí alentado por mi profesor. Ah, ¿y cómo, cómo es la ropa? Mi ropa es de color rojo y verde, que es una combinación hor mm. horrible. ¿Y te gusta tu equipo? Um, me gusta mi equipo, ya que son todos, se apoyan mm. y somos amigas. Ah, muy bien. Eh, eh, ¿te, gusta, ¿Te gusta jugar todo el tiempo? A, a veces no me gusta jugar si el tiempo es malo o si vuelve. Como hoy. <laughs> sí. <laughs> okay. ¿Desde, cuándo cuán, perdón, ¿Desde cuánto tiempo juegas? Juegue, juego desde hace siete años. Mm -hmm. ¿Y dónde haces el entrenamiento? Uh, lo hacemos en el colegio secundario local. Ah, sí, sí. ¿Y muy a menudo? Uh, normalmente hacemos el entrenamiento todos los lunes. Mm, ¿Y te gusta jugar? Sí, es muy fácil y interesante. Mm, ¿Y juegas tam también partidos? Uh, sí que solía hacer un montón de natación. Sí, no, no. Uh, mm -hmm. jue jue juegas partidos. Oh. Partidos de baloncesto. Sí. Todos los domingos por la mañana a las 10. Mm. ¿Y practicas o practicaste otros deportes? Sí, que solía hacer una, no, un de montón de mm. ¿Y hay otros deportes que te interesan? Me gustaría montar a caballo otra vez como solía hacerlo con de, mm. um, Cuando, yeah, cuando, cuando. So, a, a, hace unos años, ¿sí? Yeah, sí. Sí, sí. <laughs> sí, sí. Y uh, um, te gusta ma, te, te gusta montar a caballo. Es, sí. es fácil. Sí. Sí. <laughs> yeah, para mí no. <laughs> okay. Hay hay deportes que no te gustan. 
Um, si no me gusta ni el fútbol mm -hmm. o ni el rugby, porque los encuentro bastante aburridos a ver. Mm, muy bien. Ok, ¿y qué haces para relajarte, para descansar? Um, me encanta escuchar la música. ¿Qué tipo de música? ¿Tienes un grupo favorito? Um, mi banda favorito? favorita es You Me At Six. Ok. Um, ¿Y uh, cómo encajas tu, en tus pasas tiempos con tu trabajo? En mi tiempo libro, me gusta leer libros y ver la televisión. Mm, muy bien. Muchas gracias. Ok, muy interesante. Adiós. Adiós. Right, hopefully you can hear me. I, ha I just got logged off again and have just had to uh, log in once more. Um, I'd like you now to look at the boxes, content and response, range of language and accuracy. Um, we've limited the content and response to a range of between 10 and 15. Sorry, 10 and 17. The range of language is, as you would expect, 1 to 6, and the accuracy is 1 to 6. So if you'd like to cast your votes, please, for on what you heard. For content and response, range of language and accuracy. Uh, and we'll look at uh, the marks for uh, content and response to start with. Well, the candidate does respond well to all questions and sustains the conversation throughout with only a couple of lapses. The candidate gives detailed and relevant information. And that really is, uh, you'll find that in the 12 to 15 box. We learn why she likes netball, how she was encouraged to play it at primary school. She tells us about her team, the uniform they wear, what she thinks of it, and about the training and matches. And towards the end, we learn about her other interests and dislikes. A number of responses provide more than the basic information asked for. When asked when she started to play the sport, she replies, Empecé baloncesto femenino cuando yo estaba en escuela primaria porque me sentí alentado con mi profesor. So she's gone beyond a simple answer. She expresses her opinions clearly. Mi ropa es de color rojo y verde que es una combinación horrible. And again, no me gusta ni el fútbol ni el rugby porque los encuentro bastante aburridos a ver. Quite a complicated sentence, that one. There is a little prompting when she fails to understand the question about whether she plays in matches, and the teacher examiner has to guide her back by restating the question. And she also falls down on answering the question about when she used to go horse riding. But nevertheless, the conversation generally flows smoothly, and a fair amount of information is willingly given by the candidate. The teacher examiner awarded 13 for that, and a number of you have uh, given that mark, and I think that seems to me to be a fair assessment. Uh, it's at the lower end, I think, of the 12 to 15 box, but it does tick most of the descriptors within that box, which is why I think it ought to be there. When we look at the range of language, there is a fair number of ambitious structures that appear during the conversation. For example, the successful use of pronouns. No me gusta ni el fútbol ni el rugby porque los encuentro. Bastante aburridos a ver. Together with the negative construction ni, ni. Similarly, the complex construction using soler with a pronoun. Solía hacerlo. She uses the desdeathe construction with the present tense successfully. There's a variety of tenses successfully used. The present continuous, estoy jugando. The imperfect, jugaba and solía. The preterite, empecé. As well as confident manipulation of the present tense. Normalmente hacemos el entrenamiento todos los lunes. 
There are some ambitious verbs and vocabulary used. Se apoyan, me senti alentado, desafiante. Occasionally there are mistakes, especially in more complex structures. Solía hace un montón de natación, which is a pre-learnt phrase because she uh, voices it twice. But there is a good variety of vocabulary and structures, and the use of different verb tenses is appropriate and largely accurate. Pronunciation and intonation are clear and unambiguous. The teacher examiner awarded five for range of language, and that seems to me to be fair. And uh, I think a, a number of you gave five for range of language. Uh, now moving on to accuracy. There is a fair number of errors made, including some basic, for example, agreements. Si el tiempo es mala, but communication is unaffected. When the candidate attempts more challenging structures, then the number of mistakes made increases. Me gusta mi equipo ya que son todos se apoyan. That's difficult to get your head round. Y somos amigas. And sí que solía hace un montón de natación which again is difficult to um, unravel. Nevertheless, there are many examples of accurate language, especially with shorter sentences. And the teacher awarded four for accuracy, which is what most of you have done. So we're obviously seeing eye to eye on most of these polls, which is very good. So if we can go back, please, to the PowerPoint at this stage. Right, I, I think. Um, it's a good time to show you the grade boundaries for this summer's exam. Uh, and it will show you where these candidates you've been marking would have ended up, what grades they would have been given. Don't forget this is a, out of 60 in total, because there are two oral tests, both out of 30. We're only looking at one of them, which is what the moderator does. So in order to put it into that grade boundary um, grid, uh, you need to double the mark. So if you end up with a candidate, the last candidate, I think, ended up with 22, so double that to 44, assuming they did equally well in the second task, uh, 44, that would have been a good B grade, that last candidate. And it's always worthwhile stepping back once you've marked it and saying, now is that, uh, does that exemplify what I understand to be a B grade candidate? And I think probably it does. The other thing I wanted to show you was the marking principles that we moderators adopt. Uh, this is across all the languages, so uh, German, French, Italian, they're all following the same marking principles. Uh, so I'll share these with you in four and six minutes. If a test falls short of that, uh, what do we mean by short? Well, we've decided anything less than three minutes and a half is too short. So 3 minutes 29 seconds is too short. And there's an automatic deduction of two marks for content and response only. There's no penalty applied either to range or accuracy. But of course, if they've only done three and a half minutes, um, then that may be self-penalizing as well. Particularly if it's a presentation, they've done three minutes and only get half a minute interaction. Tests which are too long, then we stop assessing after the end of the first sentence once six minutes has passed. Tests which are a monologue with no interaction, this is quite rare, but it does very often happen with native candidates who talk non-stop for about five minutes with no uh, teacher input at all. They can only get seven for content and response because to get more than seven, you must demonstrate interaction. There's no penalty applied either to range or accuracy. Now, finally, the open interaction tasks only require the candidate to ask a question. Uh, and you need to specify on the stimulus, the preparation sheet you give the candidates, clearly um, what it is you want them to do. And the best way of phrasing this is you must ask at least one question. The moderator will then be listening for one question. If you say you must ask questions, plural, then the moderator will be listening for a minimum of two. So if the candidate asks only one question where two or more are required, they lose a mark from content and response only. 
and if the candidate asks no questions then two marks are taken off from content and response only. Right, activity two we've done. That was the open interaction you heard on the subject of netball, sport and leisure. A couple of questions have arisen. Uh, one person asked how long that last uh, oral went on for. It was 3 minutes 55 seconds, so you were quite right. It was slightly too short, but not significantly. Uh, somebody else said that the it was a picture-based discussion, it wasn't a presentation, and they can do up to one minute in introducing the picture. Um, but I, perhaps they were talking about the one before, uh, a presentation, where somebody made the comment that the, um, the presentation was good, but there was uh, it was got a little thin afterwards. I think that was reflected in the mark awarded. But we're going to move on now to uh, an, a presentation on the theme of hobbies. Uh, and I'll tell you that this goes on for 5 minutes 40 seconds. Um, so remember, if you set your candidates a presentation and they do 3 minutes, you need to balance that uh, with 3 minutes of interaction because the interaction. This is the speaking presentation on hobbies. Buenos días, Antoni. ¿Qué tal? Hola, muy bien. Oh, fantástico, fenomenal. Empezamos con tu presentación, ¿vale? Cuando quieras. Hola, me llamo Zoe y tengo 15 años. Vivo en Singapur con mi familia y tengo una hermana, una hermana y una hermano que se llama Bronte Finn. Um, el deporte favorito de mi hermano es la natación y... Um, suele practicar suele practicar tres veces a la semana con sus amigas su, sus amigos um, ta, también le gusta um, jugar al rugby um, porque él lo encuentra muy emocionante y um, físico um, el entrenador del equipo de mi hermano es mi padre mm. um, y el año pasado mi padre y el, y el equipo de mi hermano fueron a Hong Kong para competir en un concurso muy grande. Um, creo que ha sido es el mejor aspecto del pasatiempo de mi hermano porque um, ganaron el concurso y um, un trofeo muy enorme. Um, Um, uh, um, en el pasado mi hermano um, solía jugar al fútbol y fue el portero mm. para uh, su colegio, para el equipo de su colegio, um, pero sin duda mi hermano prefiere um, ju uh, jugar al rugby que fútbol porque Um, es más competitivo. Um, vale. Entonces, ¿Cuál es tu pasatiempo entonces? Um, mi pasatiempo favorito es el touch rugby uh -huh. um, porque soy muy competitiva y um, me gusta um, mantenerse en forma. ¿Y con qué frecuencia practicas el touch rugby? Um, suelo practicar um, el touch rugby uh, cinco o seis veces a la semana wow. y um, todos los sábados um, juego um, para mi equipo de Tangling Rugby Club um, en un local liga. ¿Y uh, dónde, dónde entrenáis? Uh, ¿Dó mí? ¿Dónde entrenas a Touch Rugby? Um, uh, tres veces a la semana entrena, uh, entreno en um, Turf City vale. y um, dos veces a la semana entreno, entreno um, a mi colegio. ¿Y uh, en general prefieres los deportes en equipo o los deportes individuales? Um, en general uh, prefiero uh, los deportes de equipo porque um, creo que es importante um, para aprender uh, las reglas. Vale, muy bien. ¿Y um, cuándo empezaste a jugar a Tosurpe? Um, 
Hace cinco años uh, jugando al touch rugby um, y uh, en el principio um, fue muy difícil de aprender porque hay muchas reglas y um, touch rugby es un deporte muy um, complicado. ¿Y tu padre es tu entrenador también? O? Uh, no, um, tengo dos entrenadores, vale. uh, uno para mi equipo de Tangling Bobby Club, sí. uh, que se llama Aidan vale. y tiene un tiene acento um, irlandés muy fuerte. <risa> vale. um, y mi otra entrenadora es señora Pattinson. Muy bien. Aparte del touch rugby, ¿tienes otro pasatiempo? Uh, sí, uh, mi otra pasión es el yoga um, y en las, en las clases um, hacemos muchas poses, posiciones uh, incom incomodas. incomodas. <risa> Qué guay. Uh, y si, tienes, si tuvieras que elegir entre el touch rugby y el yoga, ¿qué eliges? ¿Qué prefieres? Um, prefiero el touch, uh, jugar al touch rugby porque es muy emocional, es más emocional. Son muy diferentes, ¿eh? Touch rugby sí. y yoga son sí. muy, muy diferentes. Vale. Eh, en el futuro, ¿qué, pasap ¿qué pasaportes, qué pasatiempos crees que vas a practicar? Um, en el futuro um, me gustaría um, practicar al touch rugby um, para el resto de mi vida. Oh porque um, creo que es muy importante um, mantenerse en forma. Um, sí. Vale. ¿Y en la universidad también? ¿En la universidad crees que vas a practicar? Uh, sí. Uh, um, me, me encanta um, jugar en, en un equipo. Uh, por lo tanto, me gustaría a jugar en la universidad. Right, I think most people have now voted, so let's have a look closely at that particular test. Content and response. Well, the candidates certainly communicated a good deal of detailed information about her hobbies, touch rugby and yoga. And we also learn a lot about her brother's sporting interests and the involvement of her father in the training. She frequently elaborates her responses beyond simply answering the question asked. For example, when asked how often she practices touch rugby, she responds, Suelo practicar el touch rugby cinco o seis veces a la semana y todos los sábados juego para mi equipo del rugby club en un local liga. Despite some inaccuracy of language, the message is clear and she gives a full and comprehensive answer to the question. Similarly, when asked about her other hobbies, she not only tells us, tells the teacher examiner that her other passion is yoga, but goes on to mention the uncomfortable positions they have to adopt. She expresses opinions. Prefiero el jugar al touch rugby porque es muy emocionante. And there's little or no hesitation. Uh, let's talk about hesitation for a moment, because that does come up in the uh, descriptors in the box. There is a difference between the natural, normal hesitation that everybody has when they uh, talk, uh, which is what I'm doing now, slightly hesitating as I think about what to say next. But that's quite different from getting halfway through a sentence and grinding to a halt because you don't know the vocabulary, you don't know the verb form, you don't know how to finish the sentence. And there's a, a long embarrassing pause before the teacher cuts in and either rephrases the question or, or go, moves the conversation forward. So this candidate was, was hesita hesitant, but that hesitation was, I thought, quite normal within the context. The teacher examiner awarded 17, uh, almost full marks for content and response, and that was deemed to be uh, a fair assessment by the moderator, and a number of you did actually give 17 for that. Uh, range of language, let's move on to that box. Uh, the candidate is at ease with expressing her thoughts in the language. Uh, there is a variety of verb forms successfully used. There are present tenses of common and radical changing verbs, vivo, juego, suelo. And she's accurate in her manipulation of verbs to produce the correct person. She uses suelo practicar, but shortly afterwards, 
Mi hermano suele practicar. So she's manipulated the verb soler. She uses a simple condition to express the future. En el futuro me gustaría practicar. And the preterite is successfully used. Mi padre y el equipo de mi hermano fueron a Hong Kong. Y mi hermano fue el portero. The imperfect is there. Mi hermano solía jugar, as is the perfect tense. Creo que ha sido el mejor aspecto. The candidate uses adjectives and makes them agree appropriately. Soy muy competitiva. And sometimes corrects herself when she realizes she's made a mistake. Posición es incómodos, incómodas. At ease with subordination. Hace cinco años jugando a touch rugby y en el principio fue muy difícil porque hay muchas reglas y touch rugby es un deporte muy complicado. Quite a long sentence with a lot of subordination. The teacher examiner awarded full marks for range of language. The candidate does use a wide range of vocab and structures including some complexity. The use of pronouns in the correct position, for example. Le gusta jugar al rugby porque él lo encuentra muy emocionante y físico. There are some minor errors, not manipulating the reflexive verb pronoun from mantener se to mantener me en forma. But they don't get in the way of communication, and the candidate is consistently competent in her use of tenses. I would think the performance is on the edge of five to six. Uh, the teacher examiner awarded six and gave the benefit of the doubt, and the moderator went along with it. When we move to accuracy, there are very few significant errors. Me gusta mantener se en forma, where the reflexive pronoun is inaccurate. Un local liga, where the form and position of the adjective is wrong. Hace cinco años jugando al touch rugby, an unsuccessful attempt to use the desde hace construction. And dos entrenadores instead of dos entrenadores. But none of these mistakes get in the way of communication and the candidate's pronunciation and intonation is generally good. The teacher examiner awarded six, but I would suggest five is a more appropriate mark because there are some errors, especially in more com complex structures. So if the candidate got um, 17 uh, six and five, uh, that would make a total of 28, which is an A-star performance. And it was a natural, uh, sustained conversation, which I think uh, we would agree uh, would be a good performance from uh, a candidate who knows the language and can actually converse in the language successfully. Uh, can we go back to the PowerPoint, please? Right, we're moving on to a presentation, Home and Local Area. I'd like you to listen to this one and remember what we said about those descriptors uh, and please record your marks for content and response, range of language and accuracy. Here we go. Okay, hola Alex. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Bien. Okay, ¿tien? estoy muy bien, gracias. Tienes sí. tu... Tienes tu presentación, ¿no es cierto? Sí. Y puedes empezar ahora. Sí, vale. Uh, sí. Vivo en una casa que se llama Avalon. Es una casa adosada. Uh, tener... Uh, um, hay cuatro dormitorios, dos cuartos de baños, un yeah. salón, una cocina y un jardín. Dos años atrás, casa tenía, tenía tres tres dormitorios porque una extensión de desván es mi dormitorio ahora uh, mi barrio en es uh, muy bien las gentes el ag, uh, es agradable hay uh, pero hay excepciones en el futuro me gustaría vivir en Brighton porque cada cerca de Suffolk. Ah, Brighton que es cerca de Suffolk. Ok, muy bien. Mi pueblo es, se llama Suffolk. Es un pueblo pequeño. Hay uh, el parque, el parque de cricket, las tiendas, las restaurantes. Más, uh -huh. um, hay cuatro escuelas de públicos y una escuela de privado. 
uh, más tiendas en el centro de Southwick. El centro de Southwick se llama Cuadro, El Cuadro. En general, Southwick es un pueblo muy aburrido, no pasa mucho por azar. <risa> ok, no pasa mucho por acá. Ok, no pasa mucho en Southwick. Ok, ok, muchas gracias, eh, eh, Alex. Ahora tengo unas cuantas preguntas que hacerte, eh, ok, sobre, sobre este mismo tema. Sí, eh, uh, por ejemplo, eh, ¿podrías describirme tu habitación, por favor? Claro, mi habitación no es muy grande y tengo una cama pequeña. Una cama pequeña. Ya, yeah. so, okay. so, yeah, está bien, está bien. Un escrito y un alto ordenador. Okay. También tengo un equipo de música. Me encanta escuchar música. Mientras tras estudio o hagas hago mis deberes okay. del col. Está bien. Está bien. Uh, también tengo un armillo mediano y un sofá muy acogedor para descansar. Okay. Yeah. Me gusta mucho mi dormitorio porque es mi espacio personal y nadie entra allí sin mi permiso. <risa> nadie entra sin tu permiso, perfecto. Ok, eh, tú vives en una casa, ¿no es cierto? Ahora, ¿te gustaría vivir en un piso alguna mm, vez? Um... No estoy muy cerca, Cer cerca, pero me gustaría probarlo alguna vez en el futuro. Ok, perfecto. Lo malo sería que no tendría jardín mm, para, tienes razón. para sí. jugar, ju jugar a la pelota. A la pelota. Ok, perfecto. Lo mejor sería, ah, yeah. okay. lo, lo mejor sería pero poder tener una vista, vista fantástica del mar des, mm. desde mi ventana. Cuando vaya a la universidad me encantaría inventar un piso okay. me gustan los edificios ah, o sea, cuando se vaya a la facultad a la universidad quieres rentar un piso o sea, perfecto, ok, sí. muy bien me parece bien, otra pregunta um, ¿qué es algo que te gusta de tu barrio? lo mejor de mi barrio es que hay unos espacios verdes muy bonitos en el ciudad y tiene muchos abuelos por todas partes. Ok, perfecto. Y una última pregunta, um, Alex, okay, para terminar. ¿Qué cambiarías de tu barrio? Para empezar, pondría más car carriles para bicicletas mm. en, el, en las calles okay. de mi barrio. Okay. También los jóvenes eh, necesitan más larga, largas de espacio. Okay. Perfecto, ok. Um, ¿Qué sería lo más importante, lo más importante que, que harías? Los, lo más importante sería al, al dar el impuesto a la entrada de coches el, al centro de la ciudad para, mi, para evitar que la contaminación sea un problem, problema más grave. Ok, ¿no te gusta la contaminación? A mí también tampoco me gusta la contaminación. Me parece muy bien. Muchas ok. Gracias. Tenemos que terminar. Adiós. So we didn't lose anything from the oral test. Uh, I'd like you please to record your marks, please, for that one. Content response, range of language, and accuracy. Right, I think most people have now registered their marks for that. So let's have a close look at what we just heard. The candidate did answer all the questions put to him and developed his responses in a straightforward discussion using basic vocabulary and structures. But all importantly, sometimes <clears throat> immediate comprehension was lost because of either poor pronunciation or inaccurate language. Las gentes el uh, agradable. He talked about un escrito in his bedroom presumably un escritorio. He talked about un armio, un armario, desde mi vanta, desde mi ventana. And there were incomplete garbled sentences such as, también los jóvenes necesitan más largas de especie. Presumably it meant they need more open spaces to play in. Mispronunciation of words such as eficidios, meaning edificios, and impetar, meaning impedir, 
when he's talking about preventing cars from coming into the town centre, added to the confusion. But the candidate did convey uh, opinions and provide information willingly, though there is some lack of spontaneity at times when he recited pre-learnt details. The teacher examiner awarded 10 for content and response, and the moderator agreed that that, we thought, was a fair mark because of the loss of communication at times, uh, which does affect the mark. Range of language, <clears throat> most of the test was conducted in the present tense, but there is evidence of other verb forms, not always successful. The imperfect tenya, corrected to tenia, the conditional, me gustaría, me encantaría, sería, and the inaccurate poderia, and a pre-learned present subjunctive, cuando vaya a la universidad. But most of the vocab and structures are basic and expressed in simple sentences. Vivo en un casa se llama Avalon. And they often contain elementary inaccuracies of gender, for example, and the omission of the relative pronoun. Should have been vivo en una casa que se llama Avalon. Similarly, hay cuatro escuelas de públicas y una escuela de privado. It communicates the message, despite the obvious flaws in language. But the candidate does use object pronouns successfully. Me gustaría probarlo alguna vez en el futuro. And pre-learnt examples of complexity, such as lo mejor sería and lo malo sería. The teacher examiner awarded four for range of language, and the moderator agreed that that was a fair assessment, which is what most of you have decided. When we come to accuracy, there are a fair number of errors, several of them basic, both of language form and structure and of pronunciation. And at times, these errors get in the way of immediate communication. Para empezar, one I mentioned earlier, que la contaminación sí un problema más grave, and no pasa mucho por hacer which is a complicated uh, and garbled way of saying no hay mucho para hacer. But communication with some lapses is overall unaffected. And uh, we learn a fair amount about the candidate's house, his town, his local area. Again, because of the breakdown in communication at times, the teacher examiner awarded three and the moderator agreed. So that candidate would have scored 10, 4, and 3, which is 17, and 34 is the cutoff point for grade C. So you listen to a grade C candidate. Uh, while, um, while I'm talking, perhaps I might mention another word that appears in the descriptors list, which is uh, some obvious examples of omission. Now, where do we get omission from? What has the candidate got to do to be penalized for omission? Well, this comes down to the stimulus which you give the candidate. If you provide five or six bullet points and say at the top, you must refer to the following, or you should refer to the following, then the moderator will be looking at those bullet points to see whether anything has been left out. If, on the other hand, you give five or six bullet points and say, you may wish to refer to some of the following, then there can be no question of looking for omissions. So the way you phrase the preparation sheet for the candidate, using may refer to if you wish instead of must or should, uh, will, uh, will affect whether the moderator is looking for uh, things that the candidate has left out. Right, we're at uh, 5.30. I think we have time for one more oral to listen to, um, which I think the host has got ready. Um, it is, of course, uh, sample three. So I wonder whether we could move on, please, to sample Three, the very last recording I'd like you to listen to. Hola, buenos días. ¿Qué tal? Sí. Muy bien. 
Bueno, háblame un poquito sobre tu experiencia laboral, por favor. En mi experiencia laboral, trabajé en un banco de inversiones, inversiones llamado Credit Suisse en Londres con mi padre. Cada día me levantaba a las seis y media y me duchaba inmediatamente. No me gustó despertarme temprano porque me encanta dormir. Cada... En jefe, en prefe, trabaja a las nueve y primero aprenda algo sobre el banco. En segundo lugar, mi hicieron seguir los analistas y trabajar con ellos. Me gustó mi experiencia laboral porque es muy agradable y muy interesante. Muy bien, muy interesante. Gracias. Bueno, ¿y prefieres estudiar o trabajar? Prefiero trabajar eh, porque... Estudia es aburrido, sin embargo, me, me, guste, me gustaría ir a la universidad y continuar mis estudios. Perfecto. ¿Y qué te gustaría estudiar en la universidad? universidad? In, en la universidad, estudia e económica y matemáticas porque sí está muy bien muy bien son uh, asignaturas muy difíciles uh, muy bien excelente y qué quieres ser cuando seas mayor qué trabajo te gustaría hacer contable abogado profesor ¿No has decidido? No. Ah, bueno, tienes tiempo, no pasa nada. Uh, bueno, ¿y cuál es tu asignatura favorita? Mi asignatura favorita es matemáticas porque... ¿Piensas que matemáticas son interesantes? Sí. Ah, muy bien. Yo también. Pero difíciles. <ríe> muy bien. ¿Y cuál es tu profesor o profesora favorita? Mi profesora favorita es mi inglés profesor. ¿Y por qué ella es simpática o...? Sí. Muy simpática. Excelente. Muy bien. Uh, ¿Crees que es importante estudiar una lengua como español, por ejemplo? Sí. Sí. ¿Por qué? ¿Puede ayudarte en el futuro? Sí. Sí, por supuesto. Excelente. Muy bien. ¿Y te gustaría vivir o trabajar en España en el futuro? No. ¿No, no te gusta España? No. Ah, oh, qué lástima. Bueno, no pasa nada. Muchísimas gracias. Hasta luego. Adiós. Adiós. Right, that was actually right at the end of the oral. All the teacher then said was, Ah, qué lástima. Bueno, no pasa nada. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Adiós. And the candidate said, adios. Right, I'd like you please um, to register your votes for content and response, range of language and accuracy as you did before. Thank you. Right, I think we've all managed to vote now. So let's have a look closely at that oral that we've just heard. The candidate chose to do a presentation on his work experience. 
He began falteringly, and his mispronunciation of Spanish creates problems from the start. The opening presentation lasted for one minute and four seconds before grinding to a halt, so we had fairly limited information communicated. In the subsequent interaction with the teacher examiner, he becomes increasingly uncertain, and towards the end there are long pauses and simple si or no responses, so you're never, never quite sure whether he actually understood the question. Well, the opening presentation, as I said, was short, offered limited information. We did learn that he worked in a branch of Credit Suisse with his father, that he got up at half past six and had a shower, that he dislikes early rising and prefers to sleep. We understand he started work at 9 a.m., was taught something about the bank, and then worked with the employees. Finally, he tells us he liked the work experience because it was pleasant and interesting. But even this information is sometimes difficult to follow because of inaccuracy of pronunciation and poor language construction. Key words such as experiencia are pronounced as expienza. An investment bank becomes un banco de inversiones. 6.30 a.m. comes across as a la sesi media. Temprano becomes tempraño. Me encanta is pronounced as mi encanta. And en segundo lugar becomes en siguiendo lugar. In the subsequent interaction with the teacher examiner, sentences are often unfinished. Mi signatura favorita es matemáticas porque... And then nothing. The pronunciation and command of basic language problems remain. Si da mi bien, when explaining he's good at maths, <clears throat> for instance. And towards the end, he can't respond to simple questions such as why the English teacher is his favorite and what he wants to do in the future as a career. The teacher examiner awarded 10 for content and response. But this was adjusted by the moderator to a mark of 7 which is what I think most of you awarded. It certainly is not uh, above seven. When we move across to accuracy, communication is frequently impaired through poor pronunciation of vocabulary and through disjointed and sometimes incomplete sentences. But some information is communicated despite the inaccuracies. For example, prefiero trabajar porque estudia es aburrido. Sin embargo, me, gusta, me gustaría ir a la universidad y continuar mi estudios. Well, you can follow that, even though there are flaws in the language. The teacher examiner awarded three for accuracy, and the moderator agreed it was just about enough to scrape into the three to four assessment box. But it's on the edge. It could have been a two. It's on the edge of two to three. Okay. So there we are. <clears throat> um, this candidate ended up with a total of uh, 7, 2, and 3, which makes 12, double that to 24, and it's a, an example of an F-grade candidate. And stepping back from it, I think we would agree that that is probably uh, about right. Right, in the last part of this session, we've finished listening to all the recordings, but I'd like to turn our attention to the preparation sheet which you give your candidates. We're going to look at one example of a preparation sheet uh, and look at why it's good or why it isn't good, what we could do to improve it. So if the hosts could search through uh, the archive and find the open interaction task on travel and tourism, and we'll turn our attention from marking to the setting of the questions. Thank you very much. That was very speedy. Um, here we have a task which was set this summer by for one of the students. And of course, the moderator looks carefully at these stimuli to see what it was the candidate referred to during the test. It's an open interaction on travel and tourism. I'd like you to look at it carefully and form some opinion as to whether it's well presented as a task. Is it a good task? If so, what is good about it? And then I'll give you some thoughts of my own on it. So I'll give you some, a moment or two to look carefully through it. 
Right, we've had plenty of time to look at that, so um, I'll deal with this first and then get on to questions which some of you have asked, uh, which I'm trying to uh, find, and I think I've got some of them, so I'll deal with those in just a moment. Having a look at this task, uh, it seems to me to be a sensibly planned task. Uh, it's on the general theme of travel and tourism, and the topic relates clearly to the area that these candidates come from. It's something they are probably familiar with, so it's within their comfort zone. Uh, the information given about Bristol Zoo is fairly minimal, but it's, it leaves the candidate to use their imagination and to manipulate the information they're given. Uh, enjoy an amazing world of animals with over 450 species. Visit the gardens and the children's activity center. It doesn't tell you what's in the gardens or what activities there are. The student can make it up or add something to that. Pop into the coral cafe and the gift shop. It doesn't tell what the gift shop sells. Uh, the candidate can use their imagination to develop that. Then it tells the opening and closing times. Uh, the weaker candidates probably would access that quite easily. And the prices, and also how to get there. So the information, there's quite a spread of information, uh, but it does leave the candidate to manipulate it. Looking at the situation, during the summer holidays, your target language friend is visiting Bristol with his or her parents. He or she phones you to ask for advice on things to do. You suggest a visit to the zoo. Fairly straightforward, clear, simple scenario. Your teacher will play the part of your friend and will start the conversation. Then follows the task with the bullet points. And look how they preface the bullet points. You might be covering the following points. Not you must or you should, but you might. So if the candidate leaves one out, it doesn't matter. Let's look at the bullet points. Why the zoo would be of interest. They request an opinion. Times and prices. A request for facts. What you enjoyed when you went to the zoo. Opinion once again, but this time in the past tense. Suggestions for other activities in the area. This broadens it beyond the preparation sheet. Your own plans for the summer holidays, and so does that, and it also introduces the future, what you're going to do in the summer. So there are five bullet points, but they've been very carefully designed to cover a range of information, starting with Bristol Zoo and then opening it out, widening it out to other areas of travel and tourism, and also ranging over opinions and a variety of tenses. And at the bottom, make sure you ask your friend at least two questions, so the moderator will be listening for two questions. And in an open interaction task, of course, they must ask questions. So in all in all, that seems to be a good example of a preparation sheet. Now I'm going to try and access some. Yes, one says, relating to one oral, that some of the marks were lower um, because uh, of the number of questions asked. And I can understand that. But if the candidate responds well, we must, of course, give them credit for that. Uh, somebody says, I sounded like the candidate had a prepared answer for every question. I thought there had to be unknown questions to truly demonstrate interaction and understanding. Yes, unpredictability, that's another key word that crops up in the uh, assessment criteria. And it means that the moderator will once again look at the stimulus to see what the candidate's prepared. And we'll look at listening for something which goes beyond that, uh, where the teacher introduces something. And it comes from what the candidate says. The teacher needs to listen listen carefully to what the candidate says uh, and move the conversation forward. And this very often uh, goes into unpredictability. But the, the starting point is looking at the stimulus to see what it is they actually prepared first. Students forget to ask a question in the open interaction. How many marks can they lose? Uh, that was covered in one of the earlier slides that I gave you. Uh, and just to repeat what I said, uh, if the candidate is required to, uh, to ask at least two questions and on only asks one, it's one mark off content and response. And if the candidate asks no questions at all, it's two marks off of content and response. So you mark it and then deduct two marks. Uh, 
the same question that says, how many questions must candidates ask generally? Well, it depends on what they're told to ask. If they're told to ask at least one question, then the moderator is asking, is listening for at least one. If they give two, fine, but one is the minimum. If the candidate is required to ask questions, plural, then you're listening for a minimum of two. Yes, going back to the one about house and home and town, uh, somebody says we gave 12 or 13 for content as we did learn a lot about the house and town. It's a question of judgment. and I think my commentary made it clear why the marks we gave were... Um, uh, I can't remember which one it was now. Just trying to find it again. Oh, here we are. Yes, we gave 10 for content and response because we thought it was the lower end of that mark scale. Somebody asks, when they do a presentation with questions after, do they have to ask questions? No, uh, they only have to ask questions in the open interaction task. If they choose to do a picture-based discussion or a presentation, they're not required to ask questions. Uh, somebody asked about an issue with spontaneity. What's the difference between this and well rehearsed? Well, it's very difficult to judge sometimes on what is well rehearsed and what isn't. But I think you discover if, for example, um, the candidate begins to run out of steam, uh, and although in the presentation there's a lot of uh, pre-learnt material recited, um, and then falls down in the open interaction, you can tell what is spontaneous and what isn't. Similarly, um, if you listen to the intonation sometimes, it will tell you whether it's pre-learnt. For example, I heard one oral where a candidate said, Fui de vacaciones a España, KBN, with no enthusiasm whatsoever. They just learnt it. Or another one, uh, totally inappropriate, Fui de vacaciones que uh, a, um, I can't remember where now, a Francia, que horror. <laughs> Which, and then we went on to talk about how good the holiday was, and they got a totally inappropriate uh, exclamation in and delivered in such a way that it was clearly re uh, recited rather than uh, from the heart. I can't see many more. So thank you all very much. I hope there was a useful training session for you. We did look at a range of marks and a variety of grades, uh, and I took you right through the assessment criteria and those descriptors and what they actually mean. And most of you ended up by applying them absolutely correctly. So you can feel very reassured by that. So thank you very much for your time and your patience with the technicalities that sometimes went wrong. Over to the host.